piece. We've got the family business, which is kind of romantic. Um, we've got the gold mine itself, which sits between Dog Eshley and Barmouth um, in the National Park. And of course, we've got it, every piece has a story. Uh, so if you choose anything from our brochure or, or one of our new stores, you'll find that you can pick every piece up and there'll be a story behind it, which really helps with being able to talk about our product. Um, so let me talk to you about the Welsh gold to start with. Welsh gold isn't any different from normal gold, but the Welsh gold, in a sense, has become more romantically linked with being special because it's in short supply. Now, of course, it's in short supply because it was overmined over the last hundred years. Um, but there is something unique about the gold that we pull out the ground here um, because the gold mine used to be a copper mine. So all the gold that we're pulling out of the ground is almost stained or tainted uh, with almost a pinky hue, um, which is actually what you add to gold to make rose gold anyway. So we've got a large amount of copper uh, that sits within our gold mine uh, and ob obviously influences the color of the gold that we pull out. And that's why today each and every piece that we produce has not just a, a touch of rare Welsh, rare Welsh gold, but also an element of rose gold. Um, and then of course you've got the Royal Connection, um, which I touched on before. The Royal Connection uh, is probably one of the most valuable assets or marketing assets to this business, uh, because of course you've got um, a connection with the Royal family that we've never paid for um, and what other brands would probably fall over themselves uh, to, to have. Uh, so for the last hundred years, we've been supplying gold to the royal family for them to use in not just wedding rings, which is one of um, one of the things we're best known for, but over time we've been supplying Welsh gold for the crown regalia. Uh, and this goes back maybe a hundred years. So whilst we're not uh, by royal appointment, we have a fantastic story within the brand. Um, and like I say, a story that other people would die, die for really. Um, of course, it's a family business. Uh, so I'm second generation. Uh, I took over as MD about 12 years ago. Um, but we sell off the back of this being a very family oriented brand. Uh, so if you look through our brochures, you'll see pictures of my old man, me and the kids um, walking around the gold mine, which just helps the customer feel a bit more close to the brand and uh, feel far less of a corporate brand, I would say. Um, then you've got the gold mine itself, which I explained where that was. That was between um, Barmouth and Dog Eshley. In fact, it's exactly halfway um, because there's a halfway house at the bottom of the mine. There's a pub called the Halfway House at the bottom of the road to the mine. Uh, so it's exactly halfway between the two towns. Um, and that is surrounded by about 34 acres of land, uh, which we used to access, used to access the mine uh, under what we call royal prerogative. Uh, you sort of access to the mine can be deemed a priority if um, if you're mining gold. Um, and then of course we've got each piece uh, where each piece that we produce have a store has a story behind. So if I open any if I open the brochure on any page, uh, I'll be able to find a, um, a product that's been influenced or inspired by something naturally Welsh or something inherently Welsh. So I'll tend to um, I tend to find a story uh, or a legend or some folklore, and then we'll produce um, some jewelry. Well, we'll brief the jewelry to the designers uh, for something that has to reflect that story. Um, but we sometimes don't make, um, we sometimes actually have a problem. Uh, we sometimes generate a product uh, and then add the story later on, but we always do have a story behind each and every piece. And like I say, that that is so that people will be able to talk about the jewelry that they're buying because I think this talkability is very, very important. Um, so after I've summed up those five points, that are five fundamental pillars that are very important to us, I think you probably notice that we're not a faceless corporate. We are someone, that, uh, we're a brand that I would say is romantically um, inspired by the stories behind our product. Um, so I think when we've been sitting in a multi-brand environment. Uh, so if you walk around Chester, uh, you'll probably find a handful of jewelers which uh, stock our our jewelry. You'd have um, previously Makoka, you'd have Walton's, you'd have H. Samuel, you'd have Rigby, um, and maybe one or two others. Um, but, uh, but nationwide, we have 300 stockists now. Um, and it's those 300 stockists that um, all locked their doors and went home uh, when the pandemic kicked in. So we had to find other ways of getting to the market. 
Um, like I say, we're, we're far from a faceless brand. We try and be as, um, as romantic and as close to the customers we possibly can with as many stories as we possibly can tell. Uh, so over the last 12 years, uh, since I've been running this business, uh, by luck or good fortune, uh, we've become one of the most omni-channel and multi-channel uh, jewellery brands in the marketplace. Uh, and I think that served us really, really well over the last five or six months. Um, so if I can just explain how my channels to market are cut up, I have uh, firstly travel retail, which is onboard flights, um, airlines, cruise ships, 300 wholesale stockists. So that's the likes of Walton's Makoko all around the country. So we have 300 of those. We have TV shopping channels, which I'm actually standing in my studio uh, for that at the moment. Um, we have international distribution. We have own stores, which we've just seen one open in Chester. And of course we have the most useful throughout the pandemic, the web and direct side of the business. Um, so I'll just explain how each of what, how the pandemic influenced or uh, closed down some of these channels to market. So we've got travel retail, uh, we call it TR. Uh, and that, as I say, is majoritively uh, flights and cruise ships. So we all know everything was grounded throughout the pandemic. Uh, boats were just sent out to the sea and dropped anchor. Uh, so that part of the business could be effectively red penned just put a red pen through that straight away. 300 stockists, that's the second channel to market. Also, we put a red pen through them as well. Um, essentially, none of those were operating and everybody just went home and jumped on the sunbed in the back garden. Um, shopping channels, they remained open. That was really good um, because people were able to shop from home. International distribution, that was red penned. Own stores, red penned. Uh, and then web and directs. So in a sense, all we ended up with through it at, at that first day of pandemic, well, first day of lockdown, sorry, was just two channels to market, TV shopping and web. Now what happened next surprised me because after March the 23rd, I drove to work properly, probably in shock, how quiet the roads were, um, where the business was actually gonna go, whether we'd survive this. Um, so with my 300 stockists closed down, I decided to have a sale. Um, in a sense, I couldn't offend anybody. Stockists would usually go mad if I had a sale um, because essentially I'd be undercutting them. But as they were all closed, it gave me the perfect opportunity to, um, to basically spring into action and do what I needed to do to make money and ensure the survival of the business. Um, so I had a sale for the first month and I think we furloughed approximately 140 people. Um, so the business is 170 people. Um, so obviously all the shop staff had to get furloughed. Um, and we were operating from the beginning of lockdown in this building with 15 to 20 people. So, so we went down from 170 to about 15 or 20 people. And what happened next was quite interesting. Um, everybody lay in their back gardens and um, internet shopped. Um, they're also watching TV a lot more. Uh, so I decided to buy TV airtime um, at a much reduced rate because everybody was panicking, all the TV stations were panicking uh, about whether or not we'd make, the, make it through. Uh, and also a lot of people were cancelling their, um, their times that they'd booked on all the TV spots that they'd booked. So I actually got a really, really good deal. I think I, had, I, th I, think I booked with 60% off so we were advertising um, nationally uh, on TV uh, throughout the summer at times that weren't normally the peak, the peak times because the peak times had all been almost pivoted around because how we were watching TV before lockdown and how we were watching TV during lockdown had totally pivoted. Um, our viewing habits had changed. So I bought cheap TV at off-peak times off peak meaning between loose women um, after any morning shows, but all, all on ITV, um, which actually became the most watched times of the day. So I benefited totally by coincidence um, from that shift from evening uh, viewing to morning viewing um, for a lot cheaper. 
obviously all my stockists were closed. So all of the sales that they were generating or all of the interest that these adverts were generating were fluctuating, uh, sorry, were migrating online um, and coming direct to me. Now there's an essential difference when I sell on the web um, and one of my stockists sell on the web and it's margin. If, I, um, if I'm selling something online, of course I'm selling it at full up margin. If I'm selling it to a stockist, I'm, I'm selling it to them at approximately half that. So um, you can work out the margin difference there. Um, so yeah, what it was doing was actually increasing the volume of sales. Uh, everybody was ordering in ones and twos rather than stockists who order in twenties, fifties, hundreds. Um, so I actually needed more people in dispatch uh, because the single, single parcels going out, but the number of parcels going out increased hugely. So we were doing um, throughout lockdown, you, let's use square numbers. Say we were turning over a million pound a month um, this time last year, um, throughout March, April, May, we were doing 1.4 million. We were 40% up uh, throughout lockdown because everybody was buying direct. Everybody was buying full up retail margin and um, all of our stockists were closed. They literally were closed. They locked their doors and went home. And how many of those stockists did not have transactional websites? Absolutely surprised me. They'd all gone home, they'd locked their doors and they had no other way of making money. Uh, I think if they didn't have furlough, um, they might have actually um, they might have actually reconsidered not having a transactional website. Um, and as we went into lockdown two again this time, you, I was still surprised to see how many of our stockists were slow in, in actually building a, a, a transactional website. It was just, it, well, it just amazed me. Um, so yeah, as if Brexit wasn't enough after um, sort of after the beginning of the year, we now had uh, to navigate our way through a pandemic, but then come into a situation where we're actually making more profit um, and higher turnover by selling directly through the web to all of our customers. And the only other channel that I mentioned before that actually was still functioning uh, was TV shopping. So rather than me traveling to Australia, America um, and London um, to film in the studios, we did it all like this so that I could go on a, I could appear on TV through Zoom, FaceTime or a couple of other different apps that they were using. Um, so I could actually do it from my office, uh, the comfort of my office and also not losing. If I go to Australia to do TV channel, um, I've got a, at least 24 hours flight there, at least 24 back, and I've got three days filming. So I'll lose a week of my life. And to do that three times a year, it's actually a little, little bit constraining. Um, I prefer to be in the, in the office um, because this is my job rather than presenting on TV, shop, TV shopping channels. But what I'm trying to say is that throughout the whole of the pandemic, um, whilst I was in shock at the beginning, throughout the pandemic, we actually came out on top um, which I don't think you hear many to, many positive stories at the moment about this uh, about this pandemic, but um, it suited us quite nicely despite all the worries. Um, we've actually had one person go home this week and tested positive, so I have now got agency staff in the other room uh, all dispatching our products. So um, on Friday we sent everybody home. Um, today uh, we have filled the dispatch room with agency staff. And um, this is just one of the traumas or upheavals uh, that this pandemic is bringing us. That hasn't happened before, actually. So um, today I'm going to be able to see whether or not those, uh, those guys have been slick enough to take the place of the other guys that left the building on Friday. Um, yeah, so um, once we opened, once we sort of unlocked lockdown, uh, I continued with my store expansion program uh, over the last how long we've we been out of lockdown now? Probably three months. Um, over the last three months, maybe four months, we've opened up four stores. Um, and you probably think that's silly. Um, you probably think I'm unjustified in doing that because the high street is dying. Um, but I have a belief that the high street is not dying. That's just a bit of a reset on the high street. So in opening up those shops uh, on the high street, let's use the Chester one as an example. I was negotiating a rent um, which was three times higher before lockdown than after lockdown. So I'm now paying a third of the rent 
that my landlord was asking before lockdown compared to now. So what this is going to do is it's going to bring the high street into a more unique buying experience. I think we're going to see a lot more dependent um, a lot more independence opening up on the high street. And I can actually see signs of that already, even in Chester. Um, so yeah, um, it's going to be a, we haven't weathered the storm yet, and it's going to be difficult to, to continue to operate closing stores and opening stores and closing stores again. Um, but I firmly believe that we're in the fortunate position where every time our doors close, those sales migrate to online. And with an increasing number of owned stores, um, when when the stores are open, they work coterminously with uh, our online presence. So if we're turning over, say, using square numbers, £100,000 a day online with the shops closed, once those shops reopen again, we're going to answer about £50,000 a day and the shops will make up for that missing 50. Um, so it kind of, it, it literally seems to work like that at the moment. Um, when the shops are closed, we are fortunate enough for those sales to migrate online. And when all shops are closed, like our stockists, uh, then of course, we, um, we can do whatever we like in terms of marketing activity as well. And that's what essentially helped us survive throughout this period. Um, yeah, so um, I think as a tourist attraction, this business would never have worked. Um, that's one of my dad's um, probably worse ideas. But my dad being my dad had actually bought the land, bought the mine, um, bought cable cars, bought whole, half the town in Bonthi. Um, before he actually got to the public inquiry stage to tell him he couldn't do it. So it was that sort of, um, have you ever heard the term, well, the phrase, debt really makes you um, in, uh, motivated? Uh, I think that's really motivated to do something else with this business. And luckily he found um, a, a, a method before the web to sell jewelry without stockists. And he was booking, he was booking pages in the Sunday Times U magazine um, where you could cut off the coupon on the corner of the page and send it in um, for your jewelry with a check, I think, or maybe three checks, monthly installments. Um, so from there, we've actually turned into a relatively professional um, jewelry company. I think um, had he have managed to uh, make that into a tourist attraction, I don't think um, we would have what we have today. And I'm very grateful that that never actually happened looking back. So from a hole in the ground, we've actually become a successful jewellery company. Um, today we have a range of 500 products, um, all on display in your local Chester branch. Um, unfortunately, that one's closed. We were doing click and collect for the last two weeks. Um, we just decided to close that because uh, it really wasn't working. So those girls who are in that shop are now here with me in North Wales, dispatching with our new agency team, um, which is very useful because they know the product as well. Um, yeah, so 300 stock is closing to actually turning this right around and becoming um, one of the success stories really put a smile on my face. And I think um, over the next six months, we're probably going to open up another two stores. Uh, whilst, whilst Wales were in lockdown, I was still allowed to continue building my um, new Cambran shop. And I'm hoping that Cambran shop will be open for Black Friday, this Friday. Uh, so they will open on probably the busiest weekend shopping of the whole year, so I hope they can keep up. But um, yeah, it's nice to it's nice to be able to talk positively or have a positive outcome uh, in terms of how how the pandemic has affected us. And I think we will continue to operate uh, like this because we kind of learn from how the lockdowns work now. Uh, going forward, we have a plans. We have more plans to open up about three to four other shops next year, uh, and I think. Um, We'll sit back and I will relax and probably not be so aggressively opening them. And the reason I want to open so many now is simply because the rents are such good value. Anyway, I, I'll stop boring you and I'll, um, I'll say thank you very much for uh, the opportunity to speak to you all today. And um, I'll pass over back to Emma. Thanks. That's a fascinating story. And it's most, most probably accelerated a lot of trends that were maybe going to happen anyway. But um, if there's any questions, if you put them in the chat, we'll come back and do questions at the end. Because um, I'd like to pass over now to um, Kate Malcreast, who's head of development at Story House. Story House, if you don't know, is Chester's amazing theatre, library, cinema, community space, meeting space. Um, they must probably had a roller coaster ride through this as well. Lots of innovative ideas to stay and float. Um, they even made the radio news about um, 
the outdoor cinema and your toilets being in Wales. But um, anyway, I'll um, I'll pass over to Kate and no doubt she can tell us more. Thank you, Emma. Um, hi to everybody. Uh, thank you to uh, Katrina for inviting me today. Uh, it's nice to see so many people. Uh, thanks to that story as well, Ben. That was very interesting. Um, I think there's definitely some similar themes with your journey and our journey, um, which is quite interesting to hear. So as Emma's just said, you will all know Story House. I hope you do anyway. Um, we are a theatre, library, cinema, and importantly, a community space in Chester. Um, so we were a little bit ahead of the curve um, in February. Our chief ex executive, Andrew Bentley, that some of you will know, started talking about a virus in China um, quite extensively. Um, and we were starting to think about our home produced work that was happening later in the year. And we actually canceled our home produced work that was gonna happen in June, all the way back in the end of February, because we had a feeling this was gonna happen. So that really kind of, set out our stand for what we, we knew was going to be a very, very difficult year. Um, so we did that so quickly to save, obviously, on all the expenditure for those home productions and all the staffing, um, all the freelancers we would have had to employ. Um, so we were a little bit ahead of the curve there um, back in February. So when we closed on the 16th of March, very much like Ben just said, we were in complete shock. Um, Story House, we are a charity, but I'll get back to that in a minute. 70% of our income is earned from revenue. So that's from ticket sales to the cinema, to the theatre, um, obviously to our kitchen um, where we serve drinks and food. Um, so even though we're a charity, we're so reliant on revenue, we really didn't know what we were going to do. Um, so we put 91% of our staff on furlough to begin with. Um, so the job retention scheme took away most of our staff. There's about eight or nine of us left. And really, we sat down and thought, as an organisation, how are we going to come out of the pandemic stronger? Um, we knew that a lot of other theatres across the country were closing, were going to have to mothball because of their business model, their theatres, very small, old theatres that only produce shows or have touring companies come. As an organisation, we are different. We knew that. And we were very, very clear from the beginning that we wanted to emerge stronger and still support our community in Chester and have something to offer people. We knew we were going to have to diversify. We knew we were going to have to call on our community really to support us. Um, but we didn't know the ways we were going to do it because we didn't have a building that we could open. We have over a million visitors a year. We sell over 280,000 tickets a year. So we're obviously thinking, how are we going to do this? So I'm just going to talk about some of the different ways over the last six months that we've managed to bring in revenue, um, look at building our supporter base uh, and also um, events we've been able to put on and the way forward, really, how we think as an organisation we can remain uh, sustainable, um, a benefit to our community and also um, come out stronger. So first of all, um, we... Um, it was kind of a bit of a perfect storm, really. We knew we wanted to launch a membership scheme. Um, as the senior leaders team, we knew we had our membership package pretty much put together, but we thought this was a perfect opportunity. We couldn't sell any tickets. Nobody could come into the building. All the touring companies were canceling. As I said, our home produce work had canceled. So we thought, right, this is a great time to launch a membership scheme so the community can support us. We can also ask for one-off donations and um, uh, regular giving support. And we can also ask people to pay it forward, which is a way for people to purchase tickets, gift vouchers, et cetera, to use in the future to keep that money, but also enable us to build our supporter base. So um, we also knew that the membership scheme would raise our profile as a charity. Uh, I think it's quite interesting because people, a lot of people don't know that Story House is a charity or didn't know that Story House was a charity. And before the pandemic, we were keen to drive a charity campaign forward. Obviously, I'm head of development. That's my area. We have a lot of support across the city. But actually, we knew that 60% of our ticket buyers didn't know we were a charity. So this was another thing we needed to push as well as the membership. So we launched our membership scheme. Um, Four pounds a month, a rolling scheme. Sign up online. 10% off everything um, across the building when we opened and everything online that you could purchase. You can cancel the membership at any time. Um, we had a target when we launched back in June to have 600 members. Um, we've actually got over 5,000 members um, 
in July, we were utterly overwhelmed by the response from our community. Um, and we really feel that one of the reasons this was so successful is because we coupled the membership scheme where you can obviously redeem benefits for yourself. We paired it with the opportunity to give and support and see us as a charity. So we found that over 40% of our members that signed up also gave us a one-off donation or became a regular giver. It's absolute, absolutely fantastic for us in terms of money coming into the charity, but also building that supporter base that we can then go back to, to sell tickets when we reopen, cultivate in terms of long-term donors and just drive support really. Um, so we really focused on our membership scheme to begin with. Um, then obviously we had to think about reopening the building when it came to July, still only had eight or nine of our staff working with 90%, 91% on furlough. And our big thing in terms of opening the building was obviously we wanted people to come in, start spending money again, start seeing that we were an organisation that was going to push forward, but we knew we had to make it feel safe. In a city like Chester, we were very conscious that people were not going to come back into Story House if when they first visited the building, they didn't feel it was COVID secure, clean, safe, they wouldn't come back again. So we invested in infrastructure, increased security. Obviously we had all the cleaning stations. Um, we did quite a lot of PR and marketing around the building being open and being safe and what we we're going to be able to deliver. And we do feel that made a huge difference. People certainly were cautious about coming into the building, but once people started coming in, we found that footfall increased day after day because of the welcoming that our staff gave them, the safety within the building. We are at an advantage that we have got a huge building, obviously, um, but we still feel that a lot of those extra things that we put into place in the building, the extra security on the door, um, really has made a difference in terms of increasing our footfall. Um, so that's an area that obviously when we reopened, we felt was worth investing in. Um, the next area that we knew we were going to have to do some work on was our events. People couldn't come into the building, to into the theatre. We didn't have any stage productions to put on. So we knew we were allowed to open our cinema, which is, we've got a hundred screen cinema. But we also thought, well, how can we use our main stage? How can we have people coming into the building when we haven't got anything to put on the stage? So we converted our main theatre, which sits normally up to 800 people, into a movie cinema, which has been very successful. We knew we could act like social distancing, we knew families could come in, and we knew it would hopefully increase some revenue. Um, so we ran both the cinema and the main theatre as a movie um, cinema, which has been fantastic. And then, of course, we wanted to put some events on. Our open air theatre, which many of you will know in Grosvenor Park every summer, attracts over 25,000 customers every year. We had to cancel our three um, show productions earlier um, in the lockdown because we knew we wouldn't be able to deliver those because obviously we couldn't take the actors on, we couldn't do rehearsals, etc. But we were so keen to still do something in the park. Um, we had great support from the council um, and from our sponsors in terms of how we were going to deliver something that was COVID secure. And we were able to deliver um, Comedy of Errors um, that ran through July with a stripped back um, outdoor set, um, a very small group of actors who had to work in isolation and work together under COVID um, secure rules um, to deliver um, the Grosvenor Park Open Air Theatre. People absolutely lapped it up. We sold out within 10 days, um, we made a substantial profit um, when lots of other theatres were telling us that we wouldn't be able to make a profit. We did, um, even with stripped back, obviously, F&B offerings. Um, we really, really were very, very proud of our offering for Gro uh, Grosvenor Park Open Air Theatre. And it also sent a message out that we can, we could deliver just in a different way. And I think once you've shown pe people in the city of Chester and further afield that you can do those things in a safe way, people feel more confident to be able to come to things in the future. And that's what we really wanted to do, linking back to the safety of the building. So as well as the open air theatre, we launched the drive through cinema, which we've had at a couple of locations. On Moonlight Flicks, we moved um, from the Roman Gardens to the um, Dean's Field, so we could increase capacity and increase revenue, have more showings, keep people socially distanced, feel safer, ran that programme all through the summer, again, sold out many shows, 
um, expanded to Claremont Farm on the Wirral that some of you will know uh, and ran Halloween events. Um, even when they went into tier three before we did, we still managed to um, secure uh, and put on excellent moonlight light flicks there. Again, showing as an organization, we can find ways for people to enjoy Storyhouse, enjoy the arts and, and um, hopefully support us further. Um, alongside these different ways to bring revenue in, of course, we've had support from the government. Uh, as I said, we've had uh, many staff on furlough and also as part of my role, um, we've applied for emergency funding from the Arts Council. Um, so we secu we've secured over 830,000 in emergency funding to support the theatre and support the building in terms of our community efforts. Um, we went back to our existing funders, uh, corporate funders, many of who are here, including our hosts. Um, to see if they would continue supporting us. They could push their benefits through to next year. We were very conscious to ensure that all of our funders and supporters felt they were still getting something back for their support and were coming with us on the journey of staying open and delivering to our community, but obviously that their benefits would carry forward as well. Um, we have continued to work with the council on our contract and how they can continue to support us and how we're going to deliver moving forward. But I think that one of the things that um, we've really been overwhelmed by is the support, ongoing support of our funders. But that wouldn't have been possible without quite a clear vision of how we're going to move forward, particularly with the Arts Council. So obviously we had Christmas Carol, though some of you might be coming already. Christmas Carol set, ready to go in November and then lockdown number two happened, which was a pretty big blow for us. Um, We'd sold out 80% of our shows. People were look, looking forward to coming. So again, we've had to adapt. We've had to push those shows through to December. We've had to look at new streaming options. We've also had to put extra dates in in January. But all of these things, we've been mindful of still delivering and moving when we can to our customers and our audiences. So in terms of an organization, we know that things are probably still gonna be tricky for the next six months. Um, we know we're going to have to adapt and diversify. Um, so I'll just run through some of the different ways that we think Storyhouse is, is going to deliver in the next six months. Um, we are certainly going to move away from touring productions coming, large touring shows coming. We know many of these can't rehearse at the moment. They can't come into the theatres. Um, we know they haven't been able to put ticket sales out. So we're moving towards a smaller to medium sized programme of one night shows. We can have one night comedians come in don't need the, the backstage space. We're going to have more music. We're going to home produce more of our own smaller scale collaborative work to be able to deliver. We're more in control of it. We can keep eye on costs and we can also have smaller scale audiences. We're going to have more outdoor events. Uh, we're going to be moving our Moonlight Flicks up to the Wirral again. We already have plans, if we can, in the next couple of weeks for uh, two new ventures in Chester. Um, for Christmas. Um, we are going to invest in another large um, screen so we can do um, multiple screenings at once because we know that outdoor events have proved so popular, not just in a pandemic. It seems people like sitting outside, bringing their own food and drink, having a few drinks outside. So we're going to develop in that way. Um, we're also going to grow our support of members and individuals we are currently reliant on statutory funding from the council and the arts council funding but we know from our 5,000 supporters that have come on board with the membership there are people that want to support story house as a charity we are an organization that needs support we do we support over 200,000 different individuals every year whether they're young people disabled young people um, we work with 120 different community groups and I think as an organisation that, that has been able to push their charity status further through pandemic, people have realised what we deliver back to the city. And so we know we need to grow this area of support now. Um, we are looking to get more supporters from smaller corporates in the city that are looking for a brand to identify with. Obviously, we're very high profile. Um, we've become more high profile during the pandemic being the first theatre to reopen, all the different ways we've adapted. But also we have great opportunities, as Helen will tell you, um, Helen Johnson, sorry, um, different ways for you to entertain your clients if you want to, different brand awareness on the website. We have a lot of reach in terms of our marketing. 
we really are a charity that is great to be in partnership with and we offer something different we've always got a space for you to host in we've always got different things going on preview of preview events and I think we are an organization that now people are realizing that we're a charity that you can support and get something back um, so we're going to be growing that area and of course keeping our community entertained hopefully and well supported um, in the next six months I think that's everything from me really that's great thank you very much and um, yeah I did go and see comedy of errors and I think there was it was all socially very socially distanced all the way through and then there was one hug at the end between the <laughs> twins and that was just so emotional so you just think all the, all the people you haven't hugged or whatever so it was um great production really great Good. production. thanks there. Emma I really enjoyed it. So now I'd like to turn to um, Liz Martins, who's um, HSBC's UK economist. I suppose this is the big one. Where, what shape recovery are we going to have? Where are we going next? Um, and uh, over to you, Liz. Thank you very much, Emma. If I can just unmute myself, we'll, we'll be doing well. Um, so thank you very much. It's a pleasure to uh, join you today. And I really enjoyed uh, both presentations from Ben and Kate. Absolutely inspiring. Uh, to hear how people have coped with the myriad challenges that 2020 has uh, presented. Uh, and I'll pick up on some of the themes uh, that were mentioned. Um, one of which, Emma, you said was uh, the acceleration of trends that are already in place. And I've got a couple of slides um, alluding to some of those uh, trends. But let me just start with kind of where we are. Now, economists, historically, we look to all the data like industrial production and exports and imports and inflation. Uh, and what we find ourselves looking at in 2020 uh, is Google mobility data and open table restaurant bookings and all these kind of new, um, but very, very high frequency, very upstate data. Um, so I thought I'd start with this chart, um, which tells us where people are globally uh, on the mobility front and, and nowhere. Uh, and none of the key regions of the world have got back to where we were pre-COVID. Um, Europe, I mean, had the, the biggest dip in April and then the steepest recovery, um, but we have stalled since then and started to go into reverse with the lockdown at 2.0. Um, so no one is back to normal just yet. And really we can't expect to be until we do have um, that uh, good news on a vaccine. Um, but we have changed. We've changed a lot of the ways in which we work and we've all adapted as, as, as both of our previous speakers have alluded to. Businesses across the country and the globe have adapted and found different ways of working um, in, in a, an ever resilient and, and innovative manner. Um, but I think what's interesting is that, you know, different places started have different starting points. Um, so this is people working from home back in 2018. We in the UK, at least 25% of us already at least sometimes work from home. Compare that to about 5% of people in Italy. And that explains why actually in some ways the UK cities have paid the price for this because we are so technologically um, uh, equipped that maybe we didn't rush back to our offices in the way that people rushed back to their offices in Rome and Milan. And that has its upside and downsides. It means we can hold an event like this today remotely and online, which is wonderful, but it also means that we're not picking up a coffee on the way in uh, or paying the taxi driver or, 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 or taking the train or all the other things that makes um, the economy go round. So again, the acceleration of a trend uh, that was already happening. Here's another one, cash. Um, link cash machine withdrawals fell off a cliff in April and really haven't recovered. Uh, and that was certainly a trend that was already happening. You know, we pay with our mobile phones, with our smartwatches, uh, we buy things online. You know, in COVID-19, the shops wouldn't even take cash, those that were open, because it might be carrying germs. And, and it really feels like um, this is something that probably won't go back into reverse. It feels unlikely that we all start going back towards uh, paying uh, in cash. And another trend, of course, has been online uh, retailing. Now, I agree with Ben that the high street isn't dead, but certainly online retail has been a key part of the way uh, the UK has coped with 
the pandemic. And actually, you know, the thing about the UK economy, you can't stop us from going shopping. And actually, I'll show you a chart later with the retail sales numbers. Um, it'll take more than a global pandemic to, to, to stop us Brits um, shopping. We just have to find different ways of doing it. And that, of course, is what we've done. Um, so I think what this chart really shows is um, infrequent e-commerce users. So this is probably older shoppers who prior to the pandemic wouldn't have done much of their shopping and consuming online. So that's the black bars. Um, during the pandemic, that's gone up. You know, usually it's, it's doubled for most uh, of those people and, and it's expected to go up further um, in the future. Um, so while I think a lot of people, I mean, I was trying to buy Christmas cards online last night. It was a very frustrating process. A lot of people will be very happy when the shops are back open. At the same time, we've, of course, adapted uh, to, to doing more online as well. Um, right. So drilling down to the UK specifically, as opposed to those more broad global themes. Um, first, the good news. Um, so, of course, uh, you know, the, the recovery over the summer, as, as both of our previous speakers have alluded to, was better than many had expected it to be. Um, the housing market has been a key focus of that recovery and retail sales, as I said, as well. So in the UK, we actually bought more in August, September, uh, October 2020 than we did in those same months of 2019. So you wouldn't think we'd just been through the worst recession in 300 years looking at that year on year growth and um, you know we talk about the shape of of, of the recovery um, and we talk about v shapes for the housing market and for retail sales i mean you don't get a, a much more perfect v um, than we see in these charts here and um, the housing market in particular i would say has been the strongest engine of growth it since the since the q2 lockdown um, and that's been interesting. And I think it's been driven by three things. Uh, one, people who uh, couldn't move anyway, couldn't do any what they were planning to do in the first half of the year. So had to put their plans on hold and all that demand came flooding out in one go at the end. Um, secondly, Rishi Sunak with his generous cut to stamp duty. Um, and third, all of us sitting at home during lockdown and having a good long think about our lives and what we actually want from them. Um, including in a lot of people's cases, deciding that I don't need to be so near to my office or my place of work because I can do it remotely. And I do want more space and particularly more outside space. So that has uh, supercharged a housing market recovery that's been really strong. What's interesting if we look at it regionally, and I'll come on to this, um, is that the, the, the laggard in that housing market trend is London. So what we've seen generally is people moving out of London and to all other parts. Uh, of the UK, but particularly the surrounding country uh, counties where there's a bit more value for money. And the other good news up to date as of this morning uh, is on the vaccines. And I think these have absolutely outstripped um, everything, you know, all expectations. I know the headline number on the Oxford vaccine was 70% efficacy, and now we're used to 90%. So uh, some people think that's disappointing. It's not at all. Uh, it's the average of two studies, one of which has a 90% efficacy rating. And usually the approval for these kind of vaccines is, is, is 50. So um, it's very, very good. AstraZeneca wants to sell it for $3 a pop. It's the price of a cup of coffee. Um, and it's easily distributed at fridge, normal fridge temperature. Um, so it's, it's really positive news alongside the good news we've had from the other vaccines as well. Um, of course, it's not a done deal. It's not over yet. They need to be fully approved and then the distribution needs to happen. Our government has been known to be slightly less efficient than they've promised to be. So we need to allow perhaps for a bit of that. But uh, one thing I would note in the table on the on the bottom right of this slide is the UK is well, relatively well set up. We have orders in for all of the major vaccines and particularly this one, the Oxford one, uh, AstraZeneca. So um, that should be positive. And I think what, what they're hoping is that the first vaccines can be delivered before the end of this year. Um, and that by the end of, of Q1, a really decent proportion of the population, particularly the most vulnerable, will have been vaccinated and we can start to going back to some kind of normality, which is obviously um, really, really good news. Um, so uh, that is the good news. But of course, there are headwinds and, um, and challenges as well. And um, 
I thought I'd start with, with Brexit. Now you might think on the 23rd of November, the transition period is over on the 31st of uh, December, perhaps there's nothing left to talk about. It'll all be done and dusted, signed, sealed and delivered. Uh, unfortunately not. So I've got a few headlines from uh, the newspapers uh, in the last week or so. Uh, truckers unhappy with the government's Brexit guide. City of London to be shut out of the EU with no equivalent deal and Kent to become the toilet of England. So suffice to say, we're not quite there yet. And there are still a few things that need to be ironed out. Um, and I've got a quick to do list here. Um, I mean, our central case and our, our base case that we, we forecast on is that the deal will get done, but there's a few things to do first. So we've got to finalize the, um, the disagreements on fisheries level playing field governance. Hopefully that will come this week or, or maybe next week. At some point, we've got to reserve this internal markets dis bill dispute, which is where the UK says, actually, uh, we'd like to give ourselves the right to override parts of the withdrawal agreement that we signed in January. That needs to, to be resolved. Um, the admin translating into 24 languages needs to be done. The European Parliament wants to pass it, but they'd like to have a read of it first. Um, the European Council, the European leaders need to sign off. The, UK, uh, the European Parliament then needs to vote and pass on it. And the UK Parliament needs to do the same thing before finally, at the end of the year, um, we exit the transition period. So although we do expect a deal to be done, there are a number of steps still to happen uh, in, in, in the meantime. And I think fair to say that the deal that is currently on the table is what we would classify as a hard Brexit. It is a Brexit uh, deal that will uh, that will allow the free trade of goods in the sense of there will be no quotas and there will be no tariffs. But because we have no regulatory alignment, there will still be regulatory checks, admin, um, bureaucracy and that kind of thing. And as well, we don't have much in that deal for financial services or, or any services, in fact. Um, so there will still be uh, hiccups uh, along the way. Um, and indeed, some effects are already visible. And I thought this is really striking. Um, we know that employment in the UK has, has fallen, but actually in the last year, uh, it hasn't fallen that much. If you take into account, we've had a 16% fall um, in EU nationals in the UK uh, workforce. And the evidence suggests that these people are not becoming unemployed in the UK or becoming inactive in the UK. They may be leaving the country altogether uh, in full knowledge that the rules are going to change in January and it will become much harder for them to re-enter. So we have already felt the impact uh, on the labour force uh, of Brexit. Um, I mentioned London, uh, not of such great interest perhaps to you up there, but an interesting thing to note nonetheless, wherever we look, London has underperformed relative to the remainder of the UK. If we look at rental demand, if we look at house prices, if we look at restaurant custom, if we look at the labour market, wherever we look, activity is moving out of London. Now, London has historically been the cash cow, uh, but actually um, it looks like it's in, and, 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 and certainly the Chancellor's attention is, is turning uh, north of the M25, but actually it looks like, you know, the historical engine of growth is, is, is stalling and faltering a little bit as well. And that's a consequence, I think, uh, you could say it's an acceleration of an existing trend, but certainly a consequence uh, of the pandemic and a city of commuters, um, most of whom are uh, sitting at home. So we'll hear from Mr. Sunak on Wednesday and you have to spare a thought for him because he has got a lot of things to weigh up. Uh, he told the Conservative Party conference in October that he had a sacred duty to balance the books but he needs to find extra cash for COVID-19 and not just the emergency spending this year, but the spending that we need next year and the year after and the year after, things like PPE, track and trace, vaccines, etc. He needs to fulfill this promise to level up the regions, invest in the Midlands and the north of England, but also without leaving behind the cash cow that is London. Uh, he's made all these big promises, the 40 new hospitals, net zero carbon emissions, which will not uh, come cheap. There were two and a half million people on the furlough scheme even before second lockdown. Withdrawing that stimulus and that support could end up being painful. 
And it's not like there are plenty of easy savings to be made because actually public service spending was already down 25% per capita over the last decade. So it's not like there's a lot of low hanging fruit where he can uh, make savings. So you could be forgiven for uh, feeling a little bit like this if you're trying to make everything add up. And indeed, what's notable about UK borrowing is people worry about it a lot. But if you look at this chart going back to 1960, uh, you will see how very rare it is for the government ever to balance the books. We were in surplus for a handful of the years uh, since uh, 1960. And actually, this year and next year will be record breakers, of course, in terms of public sector net borrowing. That's the cost of primarily the furlough scheme, but also all the tax breaks, the holidays, the additional COVID spending, uh, all kinds of extra things the government has had to uh, be on hand to deliver. So a difficult job for Mr Sunak, and we'll hear from him on Wednesday. Um, he will be focusing on the spending plans that he has, um, particularly that green agenda, that levelling up agenda. Um, and as far as I can see, the only savings that he's identified so far are a public sector pay freeze uh, and maybe a lower overseas spending budget, but that probably isn't enough to reduce this deficit. So further out into the year, he'll have some hard decisions to make. Um, I still think it's gonna be very hard for him to implement any real big tax increases because the conservative backbenchers, the press, the public are going to find that very difficult to swallow um, in, a, in a climate of this very, very fragile economic recovery. So to finish off on the Bank of England then, the Bank of England are helping uh, Rishi Sunak as much as they possibly can by buying uh, all the gilts and the bonds that he issues. So he borrows, uh, the debt management office issues the debt and, and the Bank of England buys that off the bank. So they have now increased their target to just short of £900 billion or a third of GDP. And the main effect that this has is keeping government borrowing costs low. Um, so that's going to continue. It may be they have to increase the target even more, but that will keep government borrowing costs nice and low. Uh, but if they feel that more needs to be done, they can push this up even further. But the other option that is has been much discussed is, of course, negative interest rates. Um, so this is a controversial option. The Bank of England has been saying since May that negative rates are a tool in the toolbox. In November, they've asked banks to feed back on how doable negative rates really are. Um, it's not our forecast. We think rates will stay on hold where they are at 0.10%, 0.1%. But, you know, if things get worse, if things do not recover in line with the bank's expectations, if the vaccine disappoints, if we get a vaccine, but even so, growth remains really sluggish, more jobs go, unemployment rises, Brexit's a disaster, all of those things, um, the Bank of England might end up feeling they do have to do more and end up talking about taking rates negative. Now, the chart on the right indicates that even rates as low as they are, are highly unpopular, but negative rates uh, could be extremely unpopular. Um, I don't think the banks will be charging us to hold our deposits, our savings, our current accounts. Um, we haven't seen that in the countries where they do have negative interest rates, um, but it means that, yeah, um, you, it, already very low rates of interest on savings could fall even further. The banks could uh, could have to put pass on the lower charge, the lower rates, uh, and therefore take the hit at the margin. So it could be very controversial. It's not our current forecast. It hasn't, in our view, been particularly successful where it has been implemented, but never say never. And the Bank of England have certainly opened the door to it. And it's something we should uh, perhaps all be aware of uh, going into 2021. So uh, that's my whistle stop tour. I'm going to stop sharing my slides and uh, we can open for questions. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, I think we've had a couple of questions. Um, first of all, actually, for Ben, um, Katrina from the, the chair of the bid has asked a bit of a practical question. And um, when you're looking for new sites, um, is it true you'd always look for a site on a corner so you get the window and the side return to maximize the display of all that lovely jewelry? Are you on mute? Am I on mute? It's me, don't worry. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, it's a good, good point that. Um, in theory, I should. Um, and probably my best stores are all on a corner. Uh, the one in Cardiff is inside, it's inside SD2, um, SD2 shopping center. Uh, that's on a corner. Uh, Cardiff, as you know, is on a corner. Sorry, Chester, as you know, is on a corner. But to be honest, I'm choosing towns based on how well my stockists do at the moment. So if you can imagine a heat map um, and my best stockists in bright red and then my worst stockists in um, white, uh, if you like. So a map of the UK, I can see where my product is working exceptionally well through a heat map, uh, which is you can do it through Google. You can do it through the Microsoft um, app as well. Uh, you can work out where you, all your hotspots are around the country. And then I'll just open up, I'll try and open up a store right in the middle of there, providing it doesn't upset my customers too much. So um, most of my recent uh, new stores have been where people have wanted to retire. And I already know that my product works in that store. Um, so I, I, funnily enough, through lockdown, I got quite a few requests of people who had been on lockdown, enjoyed the summer, never actually stayed at home for so long and enjoyed that new way of life. So this sort of life change for a lot of people uh, was one of the reasons I was getting to, um, I was getting offered opportunities on new stores. And secondly, um, the uh, succession isn't always uh, what the next generation want to do. So um, I was being offered new stores, well, new to me or existing stores um, because I was already trading with them. I was being offered um, certain opportunities because the next generation son or daughter might not have wanted to continue the business and they've probably got more professional jobs. Uh, so a lot of these uh, were going to either close down or I would take them on. So yeah, so I already know where my product is working and I'm being offered um, uh, businesses because of the, cha the timing change, because of the life change due to the timing. Great, thanks. Um Question I'd like to ask, um, and then we've got some more questions from the floor there. Um, how important are international sales to your business? Um, what routes to markets have you used? And you have mentioned the B word um, with Brexit coming up, uh, or sorry, the end of the transition period. Um, have, have you had to put, sort of in, have you stepped up your preparations for the 1st of January? Um, to be honest, I, I've continuously asked whether we've actually um, made all the preparations we need to in terms of uh, being ready for January. However, it's gone on for so long now um, that these preparations have actually sort of, we did prepare, uh, we made a lot of changes. I ordered an extra stock of packaging oil, we upped the amount of stock that we had in our safes um, and we made whatever provisions we could in terms of buying the gold and buying the dollar forward. Um, but in reality, none of those things would have, would have helped us. Um, so um, we're just gonna trade through it as normal. Um, and what was your first question? So how, how important is your international sales and what routes to market to reach uh, yeah. the international markets did you? Um, so as, as I mentioned before, shopping, uh, shopping channels are of particular interest to us um, and international shopping channels along with travel retail probably account for 20% of our um, overall turnover. Uh, we've seen those dry up totally, they've gone. Um, but what's happened is that the other side of the business has grown uh, enough to overcome that as a problem. Um, routes to market will come back um, that'll be probably for next year uh, well certainly for next year now um, and what we'll we'll find we have um, a partner in China uh, we have routes to market in America we have routes to market in Europe but none of those are actually active at the moment they've all pretty much dried up thanks for sharing that um, and then this next question which I suppose for Ben, and then maybe Liz, if you, if you could maybe give your thoughts on it as well, is with um, Ben's experience of being able to negotiate much reduced rents, um, do you think that's going to actually keep our high streets alive? I actually do. Um, I think that they needed resetting. I think um, rates and rent have been artificially high for some time now. Um, what is the point of me going to shop in Chester when all the same shops are in Broughton or um, the next town. It's it's something that I think we've all been bored of seeing, and maybe Topshop Group or Arcadia Group are a lot to blame for that. But you would you would find no, I suppose, significant difference between shopping between towns in some points, and that's because they were um, 
they were doing so well and um, I suppose landlords were able to put rent up on them but that's all come full circle now um, and the web has basically meant that that's not practical anymore so this is a reset and I think um, when I mentioned before that I, my rents and rates sorry my I brought my rents down by uh, a third in the case of Chester I think that's going to happen everywhere I was talking to Chester before lockdown uh, to the Chester landlord before lockdown so I know from a fact that that's fallen by two thirds um, and it's what I'm seeing in Cumbran that we're opening up this week um, that rent is significantly uh, improved from what it was when we were talking post uh, pre lockdown. See you to Liz. Thanks. Um, yeah, no, I agree. I, I think uh, I think the high, the high street is far from dead. I think one of the things um, that may change a little is is we're all spending much more time in our own neighbourhoods if we are working from home. So we may be less likely to commute into the centre of town and use the shops there, but we may be more likely to walk down the road to our to our local high street. So things will kind of shift a bit there. Um, there are, you know, I think this this trend of um, uh, of online retail, of course, has been growing for for several years and, and won't stop. And and you know, the pandemic has thrown up specific challenges. Like I, I note that the uh, the price, in particular, of high heeled shoes has collapsed because nobody's buying any high heels in 2020 for obvious reasons. Um, so there's going to be specific areas and specific challenges, and there's going to be areas where we will move online because it's just much easier. And then there's areas. You know, like I mentioned, I want to go to a shop and buy my Christmas cards or if I'm buying a pair of trainers, I want to try them on or if I'm, you know, if I'm buying jewellery, I want to see it, you know, physically. And I think that stuff isn't going to um, completely disappear. And especially I think if, if, that, if high streets combine that with offering, you know, the, the, the service experience, so the, the things that you can't get online, like a manicure, a pedicure or a coffee uh, or a pair of glasses or a dental appointment, you know, and, and, and it makes for, you know, it, you know, it, the, the, the appeal of the high street clearly is still going to be there. And if, um, you know, the Ben's experience is replicated uh, across across different retailers and, and there are much lower rents and if government support is not withdrawn as well, I think that's important because retailers have benefited from you know, lower business rates and what have you, and, and probably can't, many of them can't cope with a big bill suddenly being reinstated uh, next year. If that all happens, then I think that's, that's, that's really good. And I also think that we, we've all spent a lot of time in our homes this year. A lot of us have enjoyed part of that, but I wonder whether there's also going to be a, a reaction whereby we all want to go out and see each other even more than we were doing before, because we've all, um, yeah, spent so much time at home. So yeah, I do think there's lots of, lots of reasons to be positive. That's great. And um, we've had one sort of question on a global level. Um, be interesting to know how China's recovery has um, panned out and, and what you think their economy is going to do next year. And I suppose on a local level, I think the point you've just made that Chester's a really, I think we like to think it's a really livable place. Um, you know, everything's very close by. And I don't think we've seen activity drop off in the city centre. Um, OK, I might have thought it was a bit sleepy hollow sometimes, but um, actually, throughout, you know, it's been steady all the way through and should really, you know, we should be really shouting about that maybe and promoting our city to two people in London, two people in Manchester. I suppose Sadiq Khan saying that there's an existential threat to big places like London. And, and maybe this is where um, the smaller cities like Chester can really get in there. But um, yeah. So Absolutely. China. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so starting starting with China, um, I mean, the, the, I mean, obviously China went through this journey a bit before all of us. So they were out of lockdown while we were just sort of going into it. And they've had a slow and steady recovery since then. Um, but it's been driven really by manufacturing. And that's been where it's, it's been strongest. And then on services, uh, much slower and still, I think, I just even even until very recently still below the baseline so in terms of yeah going out hospitality uh, retail all of that it was very slow to recover and I think that just makes sense in terms of you know you may have just you may have brought the, the virus under control but you haven't got a vaccine and people are still very nervous and they lived through some pretty awful times at the beginning so um it's been a slow recovery in services um and the, and the Chinese government is now turning their attention back to uh, to focusing on manufacturing. And that seems to be having um, positive results, actually. We had the UK manufacturing number out but survey this morning um, and pointing to strong export demands from China. So actually, the Chinese recovery has been slow and steady, focused on manufacturing. And to the extent that that manufacturing sector is doing well, that, that appears to be benefiting us 
um, here in the UK, and 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 that's and that's great. Um, in terms of um, the, the the Chester story and, and the regional stories, absolutely. Um, I think again, accelerating a trend that was already in place. Um, people, the the the, the, the centre of economic gravity has been slightly shifting away from London in the last few years, um, and I think the pandemic absolutely accelerates that. We've all learned how to use Zoom and realise that we can do most of what we do uh, remotely online. Um, and if, if that's the case, then why would you not want to go and live uh, somewhere different, you know, somewhere quieter, more affordable, perhaps somewhere with more green space, more access to the countryside, all of that stuff, and, and perhaps uh, much more value for money in property. So um, I definitely think, you know, and, and, and add to that the government investment as well, that, you know, clearly the government's program is going to be focused on um, yeah, areas, areas in, in the north and, and the Midlands. So I think, um, yeah, all, all, all very positive. That's great. And um, that's brilliant. I'd like to thank all our speakers today. Um, I don't know how we do this, whether we just wave or clap or whatever, but um, thank you so much for, for being here today. Um, I think we're now going to move on to if people want to stay behind, we'll try and put them in small groups for a bit of networking. But really, thank you so much to everybody today for, for attending. Thank you. And it's over to you, Helen, I think, to sort this next part out. Yeah.